We've all been there. We booked the trip of a lifetime to a legendary destination, New York City, the type of place we recognize from TV. Yet when you arrive, you're overcome with the nauseating sensation of disappointment. You try to repress the facts. You expected the smell of garbage, the terrible traffic, and even the occasional degenerates. Yet something is off. Somehow, no one warns you about the obvious, the fact that other tourists Tourists like yourself pervert everything you thought you'd love about the city. This hasn't always been the case. You see, mass tourism on such a corporate scale is a relatively new phenomenon. And spoiler alert, aside from the money it brings in, it doesn't add much value. But when did this all begin? Today we discover the history of tourism in New York City and how it has eroded the city's culture. I'm your host Ryan Sokash and you're watching It's History. How did we get to jam-packed double-decker buses and an economy of trinkets? Well, for context, let's start at the very beginning. Archaeological excavations indicate that people first settled in the area that became New York City 9,000 years ago. However, the site was abandoned due to the extinction of larger game that the original inhabitants depended on for food. The second wave of humans entered the region approximately 3,000 years ago, and they left behind advanced hunting implements such as bow and arrows, and it would be the descendants of these settlers who would become less nomadic thanks to their slash and burn farming techniques. These natives remained on the land that would become New York City until they met the Europeans some time later. In 1613, the Dutch established a trading post on the western shore of Manhattan Island, with Juan Rodriguez as the first non-native to live there full time. By 1623, what would become Manhattan went commercial. Basically, the newly formed Dutch West India Company built Fort Amsterdam, a crude fortification that stood on the present-day site of the U.S. Customs House on Bowling Green. The fort was designed mainly to protect the company's trading operations further upriver from attack by other European powers. Within a year, a small settlement called New Amsterdam had grown around the fort, with a population that mainly included the garrison of the company. Obviously, this period was not beneficial to the natives and the situation wouldn't improve as the word about American prosperity spread rapidly. New economic activity brought a wide variety of ethnic groups to the emerging city during the 17th century, including the Spanish, Jews, and Africans, many as slaves. To the Europeans, New York was the obvious location for a metropolitan and ultimately evolved to become one of the most important cities in the United States. So with that in mind, when did the tourists actually start arriving? Although noble exotic tourism had existed for centuries, the dangerous journey across the Atlantic presented some obstacles for those wishing to see New Amsterdam. In most cases back then, unless you had a business or political reason to go, it was probably better to stay back on the old continent. It wouldn't be until the first half of the 19th century that tourism would emerge alongside the steamship. This should be obvious. After all, the steamships had upper-class accommodations but since most Americans were descendants of immigrants fleeing poverty, there isn't much storytelling or even interest in the topic of luxury travel from those times. You probably never considered the factory owner from Wuj, Poland crossing the Atlantic with his wife just for a holiday, yet tourists like that did exist. Still, in the early days, it was a gritty experience because once they departed the luxury of the ship, the posh life back in Europe ended. American hotels were simply subpar. According to Richard Gasson, the first tourist to arrive in New York City came in the early 1820s as an outgrowth of the fashionable tour. The city back then was modestly prepared, offering only second-class hotels and limited summertime entertainment. However, rising numbers of tourists led to steady growth in these key areas, and that got the ball rolling. In fact, by the financial panic of 1837, tourists played a vital role in keeping the hotels filled and the theaters or museums operational. The long-term effect of this early tourism would be crucial to developing New York City as the country's center of culture. But what could a visitor expect upon arrival back then? Well, I found an old antique guidebook. Let's have a look at it. 
to find out. Early forms of guidebooks were totally different from what we know today. You see, before the American Revolution, travel literature took the form of memoirs, personal narratives, reminiscences, published correspondences, diaries, and journals, such as the Journal of Lewis and Clark. Yet even when the tourist industry began to develop, it was barely noticeable to the city's inhabitants. Remember, it was only the elites that could really make the transatlantic trip to do a bit of shopping, and the domestic market tended to be a bit more dignified, hence they simply blended in with society. The type of wholesale junk food or trinkets that most visitors to New York City seek today would have been outright offensive to those who were in search of culture. However, by the later part of the 19th century, a domestic industry emerged, bringing along with it the guidebook for your more average Joe. The article, Old Time Tours, New York City Guidebooks in the Early Republic by Andy McCarthy, describes this innovation adequately. It reads, Early authors of New York guidebooks exhibit a sense of innovation. Writers Edmund M. Blunt and Samuel Mitchell, who penned guides in the 1810s, are vanguard writers who took the first stabs at crafting an identity for the city by describing its civic and cultural institutions, hotels, clubs, churches, public reading rooms, and the rates and timetables of street and waterway transit systems. They also included sketches of Manhattan, listing laws against nuisances like filth and dirt and crosswalks, and well touting the delightful promenade of the Battery, also listed and described all of the different courts in the city's judicial system. Most practically, these first guides are omnibus literary vessels of information that fit conveniently into the front pocket of a man's frock coat. Even so, the city was a hard sell. Locals associated with work, outsiders were put off by the crime and slums. Yet the guidebooks emerged, and in a way, the barrier to entry was lower. So let's have a look at what was offered. The 1837 publication, A Glance at New York, embracing the city's government, theaters, hotels, churches, mobs, monopolies, learned professions, newspapers, rogues, dandies, fires and firemen, water and other liquids, etc., was written with sarcasm and offered offered an intimate sense of the daily behaviors typical to city life. This publication was, in many ways, a practical guidebook. The publication offers cultural experiences such as grand architecture from the 150 churches in existence at the time, while also pointing out that the city had a significant atheist community. The guidebook then goes on to offer some rather direct social commentary. Quote, the population of dandies in the city is about 3,000. As characterized by the author, Green, dandies are fanciful, garbled, jobless airheads whose ogling behaviors alienate the opposite sex. They are divided into three classes, chained dandies, switched dandies, and guzzling glass dandies. So distinguished from those harmless pieces of ornament which they severely wear around their persons or carry with their hands. So make of that what you will. By mid-century, New York guidebooks boomed alongside population growth, which jumped from around 515,000 in 1850 to 813,000 in the following decade. The content of tourist opportunities became ample. Quote, urban guides, as they were known at the time, actually began to target your average citizen. Today you might summit the Empire State Building, but in the 1850s, the highest man-made point was a part of the Crystal Palace, known as the Ladding Observatory. This tower offered visitors a lookout over 300 feet above the ground, with a spire and flagpole adding another 50 feet in height to the structure. People were meant to ascend by a steam elevator, although this has been widely debated. We do know that a winding staircase was climbed to look out upon what must have been an unimaginable sight. Refreshments and ice cream saloons were located on the lower floors between West 42nd and 43rd Street near 6th Avenue. Apparently, industry itself was also a major attraction. At East 12th Street and East River, there was an extensive range of buildings called the Novelty Works, which featured so-called steampunk whizbags like the, quote, cutting engine, the bending and punching engine, and the boring engine. Well, well, one of the cleverest controversies was known as Burden's Gold Crusher, where a visitor gazed upon torrents of hot metal and a lake of liquid fire, but all controlled and fashioned by the most potent of magicians, the well-instructed man 
of science. The book also offers ideas for physical activity. For example, between 159 and 161 Crosby was the fitness institution or gym, but membership was not cheap at a whopping $12 annually. The 1871 Hotel Guest Guide for the City of New York offers some attractions that definitely don't exist today. Visitors were welcome to shoot muzzle guns of international makes and go shopping for quote, toilet soaps. You could also buy a French clock, a ball costume, or a music box. There were so-called human hair goods for the ladies with fine wigs and hair products imported from France. Surprisingly, many of the tourist traps back then still exist today. The book proposes diamond dealers and watch stores. The guide wasn't all fun and games though, as it recalls some rather intense history. Here's one section that stood out to me. As illustration of the enormous increase in the value of real estate, it may be mentioned that a lot on the northwest corner of Chamber Street and Broadway was purchased by a gentleman who died in 1851 for $1,000. Its present value is now estimated at no less a sum than $125,000. The site on which the new Herald building now stands was purchased by James Gordon Bennett Esquire for $400,000 a little more than two centuries since the entire site of this noble city was purchased off the Indians for what was equivalent to the nominal sum of $24. Now the total amount of this assessed property tax is $10.5 million. If such vast accessions of wealth have characterized the history of the past, who shall compute the constantly augmenting resources of its onward course? The book also offers a sense of rapidly developing technology from the time. Reading, half a century ago, the uses of the mighty agent of steam and electric current were unknown. Now, the whole surface of our vast country is threaded over with a network of railroads, and our seas, lakes, and rivers are thickly studded with steamers, stately vessels freighted with the fruits of commerce, all trending to this city as the central market of trade. Half a century ago, it took weeks to transmit news from New York to New Orleans. Now, our communications are conveyed over the length of the land, almost with the velocity of the lightning's flash. Now, the winged messengers of intelligence are multiplied with the marvelous rapidity of 60,000 copies an hour. The tourist guides of the late 19th century focus on architecture, much of which has since been demolished, but they also encourage visitors to spend time in the park, which the author claims had virtually zero crime. I often romanticize this period of American history, but it is magical to imagine that the city had such seemingly innocent offerings, from the park to the observation tower and even its own maze. But don't get me wrong, the tourists also enjoy the more raunchy aspects of life. For example, our 19th century guidebook also recalls that in the evening, men recreate at so-called watering establishments. So if we compare this to the modern day tourist experience, it all sounds pretty cultural, right? So I bet you're wondering, where it all went wrong. The turn of the century saw masses of immigrants coming over from the old continent and bringing with them significant change. The Ladding Observatory had long since burnt down, and now the sky was filled with soaring towers. This is by all means my personal favorite period of architecture, with legendary buildings such as Singer Tower or the World Building coming into their prime. Public transportation was very developed and street signage was basically comprehensive. The best part perhaps was that thanks to the subway, excrement from horses was less of an issue. Your average American could now experience a small taste of the high life, a temporary illusion that brought dignity. One would often arrive via train at the original Penn Station where they were met with its stunning entrance arcades and a waiting room reminiscent of old Rome. This perhaps humbling gateway set a tone that New York respects those who enter. It respects them with a greeting of artistry fit for royalty. In fact, royalty would often enter the city via that same gateway. In my opinion, architecture that makes powerful gestures also imposes expectations that society would like to live up to. This also applied to tourists. Fast forward to the modern day and consider it, it hasn't changed. When you're on a cruise, you eat like a pig because that's the expectation of the environment. When you're at a nightclub, you'll pay $1,000 for a bottle of alcohol with a market value of, let's say, $25 for that exact same reason. The tone was set when 
when you entered the door. By the 1930s, tourists could stay in outstanding accommodations, such as the Art Deco Hotel New Yorker, which was once home to Nikola Tesla for 10 years, as well as being the hotel of choice for Fidel Castro and many other prominent people of the time. The Hotel New Yorker had its own coal-fired steam boilers and generators, sufficient to produce more than 2,200 kilowatts of direct current electric power, making it the largest private power plant in the United States at the time. The Waldorf Astoria was the world's tallest hotel until 1963 and was an icon of glamour and luxury. Even today, it is one of the most prestigious hotels in the world. The original building was demolished to make way for the Empire State Building. Still, the new location was epic. Each room had a telephone line and first class room service. The original facility hosted notorious guests such as Buffalo Bill and Prince Henry of Prussia, with the new building hosting VIPs such as John Wayne and Charlie Chaplin. Apparently, Brooke Shields had her first encounter with the paparazzi at the hotel. At the age of 12, finally, Paris Hilton lived in the hotel with her family for a time in the 1980s and 1990s. Yes, Paris Hilton is a key part of New York history. Come the mid-1950s and 60s, America began tearing down the architecture that empowered ordinary people. This was also when corporations began exploiting customers on a whole new level. You see, in the same way that the original Penn Station's grand halls empowered an individual, corporations set a tone of low expectations. Let's say the mindless selling of a lifestyle with a glittery surface, but a hollow inside. Marketers also had new, powerful means to broadcast their messages, images sent over the airwaves. Marketing was also simplified and targeted more broadly. Now, you might find yourself thinking like, Ryan, hold up, why would corporations want to dumb down the tourist industry? Well, long story short, Anyone with a shallow ability to think critically makes for a fantastic consumer. This is why corporations will always enable your vices and never challenge you to improve. For example, the I Love New York slogan and logo was the basis of an advertising campaign developed by a marketing firm in the 1970s. The idea was to promote tourism in the state of New York, including New York City. The logo was designed by graphic designer Milton Glasser in 1976 in the back of a taxi and was drawn with red crayons on a scrap of paper. The original drawing is actually held in the Museum of Modern Art in Manhattan. The simplicity of this logo really made New York accessible to consumers, and this was the moment I believe tourism in New York City, in connection with American culture in general, took a turn towards what we know today, a society focused on tourist traps. But what exactly is a tourist trap? The Collins English Dictionary defines tourist traps as places that, quote, attract a lot of tourists where food, drink, entertainment, etc. are more expensive than normal. Another scholar defines tourist traps as, quote, sites and activities meant to draw money from tourists. These destinations draw tourists in at all costs, offer no cultural value, and appeal to primitive tastes. A tourist trap is the complete opposite of culture tourism, as it's only intended to draw money from visitors. Professor Zygmunt Kruczek probably summed it up best in his study, quote, tourist traps are attractions that are no longer primarily visited for the original essence of the attraction, but because of an acquired or constructed self-perpetuating fame, popularity among tourists as a must or frequently visited place, usually as an outcome of overmarketing and promotional processes, creating a state upon which an attraction and local supply system have become codependent for revenues. In other words, the entire actual purpose people visit New York City is to have their money taken away, but it's difficult to notice because it all happens under the veil of the world's most powerful tourist brand. New York City. And this is why you felt so repulsed in New York. You expected culture at the museum, but you could barely see the artwork through the crowd of people. You wanted to visit the Statue of Liberty, but you spent the entire day standing in line. You got hustled every step of the way, from the airport to that double-decker bus. So why are things this way? Well it all boils down to economics. According to Tourist Economics, in 2019, visitors to New York spent nearly 73.6 
$1.5 billion, generating $19.3 billion in tax. The numbers break down as follows. Visitors spent $21.4 billion on lodging, $17.9 billion on food and beverages, $13.7 billion on transportation, including both local transportation and air, $13.4 billion on retail shopping and gasoline stations, and $7.3 billion on recreational activities. So for the city government, tourism is a huge win. For residents, the tourist economy means jobs and trade. In fact, according to the Tourist Economic Report, without tourism, the city's unemployment would have gone from 4% to 12.5%, which would obviously lead to more poverty and crime. When you attribute this hypothetical 8.5% increase in unemployment to such a large population, you'll realize that the alternative to some annoying tourists would be far worse. It would be unsafe. It all starts to make sense from the city's perspective. Hell, if I was a New Yorker, I might set a few tourist traps of my own with 60 million people visiting annually. Now the good news is that New York City does not have to be a tourist trap. The simplest way to save yourself the disappointment is to have a purpose for your visit. And by all means, avoid the places everyone tells you are a must-see. Most of what people tell you to see is just a repetition of someone else's PR talking points. These were designed to take your money away. We no longer have the grand halls of Penn Station, but still, as customers, it doesn't mean that we have to participate in the bigotry of low expectations. New York City offers many incredible experiences, and you'll love your time there, so long as you don't fall into any tourist traps. We'll leave it there today, but let me know your thoughts in the comments section below, DM me your episode ideas on Instagram, and definitely don't forget to watch our playlist on New York City history. Until next time, guys, this is Ryan Sokash, signing off.